Good morning, Anderson Hills. How are you guys doing today? Good. Why don't you stand up with us? All right. I got people clapping already. That's good. All right, let's stand up. We're getting ready to do some music together, and we're going to sing. But you know what's beautiful? It's not coming to watch, but it's coming to be a part of it. And every person in this room this morning, you're invited. You're invited to be a part of what we're doing. Is that okay? All right, let's get going. Good morning, children of God. Morning. It's good to have all of you here this morning. Uh, glad that we're ending the week and beginning the new week here together in this room together. If you're watching us online, good morning and welcome to our service as well. I'm Chip Mahaney, a member of the church here. And just a couple of things to tell you about what's going on in our church before we get back to worshiping and hearing a great message today. Uh, you know, it's been a tough week in the southeast and in, in the mountains of North Carolina and places like that, Florida, Georgia. Uh, we are a giving church in many ways, and so we work through Matthew 25 Ministries, and there is a link for information about what they need. Obviously, cash is always good, uh, or certain supplies that they might need for serving down in that part of the country. So you can go to our events page for that. Speaking of serving, we are having a kind of a dedicated serve week for the church uh, in a couple of weeks, October 13th to 19th, and again on the events page, you're going to find like a list of things that you can uh, check off, sign up for. Some of them are really simple, like might take you a few minutes or an hour. Others are more involved. Uh, some are just simply kind of clerical tasks, uh, test, tasks that need to be done. Uh, others might be more spiritual and more, more kind of from the heart that you could do. But either way, we need everybody and everyone to sign up. So please look at our website and, and check the box and sign up for something that you can participate in for our All Church Serve Week then. 
And then at the end of the month, we have our marriage retreat. And so uh, my wife and I are among 40 couples who are signed up for this. Uh, it'll be at the airport, and we've got a lot of people coming. Uh, there's still room for you, you and your spouse as well. So please join us. Uh, at the end of October, you can sign up again on the events page. Um, and then, again, all of this is made possible because of your generous giving through the week, through the year. Uh, we ask you that if you want to give today, you can give to the app. You can drop off uh, envelopes or, or uh, donations in one of our bins right outside the doors where you came in today. We've got a great service today. Let's worship. Why don't you just stand and join us? How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation. Who could? 
up by your bed When you fold your hands and bow your head Throwing out another prayer in faith When you're wondering if he's hearing you Look at me, I'm living proof I'm only right where I am today Because somebody prayed So I Looks like somebody prayed. For the child of God that's far from home, the one who thinks they're too far gone, I'm throwing out another prayer in faith. Worn out altars, disdained views, still I won't give up on you. I believe that anything can change when somebody prays. Somebody pray. I've seen miracles come from feeble words. I've seen hospital rooms turn into cathedrals. I've seen freedom come to the prisoner. You can't tell me that prayer don't work. Cause every night there by your bed when you fold your hands. Not a single word you've ever said in vain. He hears everything. Somebody pray. Amen. Amen. Lord, I pray. We, we know that when we pray that you hear us. We know that sometimes the answer that we get is the one that we're hoping for. And sometimes the answer that we get is not the one that we're hoping for, but the one that we need. And I just, I thank you, Lord. We're so thankful that you're there to hear our prayer, to guide us in the right direction, to, to answer the things that we need answering, whether that's an answer we want or we don't. We know that your love is boundless, your grace is boundless, and we're just so thankful and so lucky to have it. In your holy name I pray.
of that pain, that you would meet us, Lord, and that you would turn our eyes on you, for you are the one who calms storms. You are the one who walks on water to be with us. You are the one who will never leave us nor forsake us, God. So we place our lives in your hand today. We trust you, God. And Lord, we pray that for us as a church, God, that you would bring new wine from us, Lord. God, that you would do the work that you want to do through us, God, that you would use us to spread your good news, both here in Anderson and around the world. God, that you would use us and call us. God, that you would change us 
by the power of your love and grace. God, we love you so much, and we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You may be seated, friends. I want to welcome you to Anderson Hills. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is just a joy and an honor to get to share God's Word with you today. Um, Before we jump into this week's message, though, I want to say I'm so thankful you're here. I know for many of you, you've been without power this week, and I'm glad that you still made it here today. For those who are worshiping online, uh, we just want to welcome you. Also, we're so glad that you are joining us, too. Uh, Maybe maybe it's been a more challenging week. Maybe it's been a great week, wherever you're at. Um, At our house, we We've had power. In fact, so much power. We got to host uh, one of the homecoming after parties last night, which is a great plan when you have 830 church the next day, right? But you know, if you have teenagers, you know it's always a win to have them at your house though, right? It doesn't matter what hour of the morning. So we are thankful for that. Uh, But seriously... Um, Our next message series coming up, we got the Bible reading plan, I believe, today for you. Um, It's called uh, Rise Up, and I am really excited about this series. I think it's one of the most important ones that we've done in our recent history, and uh, so I want to invite you to be present with us each week um, to be reading God's Word through the Bible reading plan. Um, In this series, uh, we're going to talk about God's call for us as a church. Um, We're going to invite you, um, we're going to launch a campaign called Rise Up, uh, where we're going to give generous generously to impact our ability to reach families uh, with kids and teens. And I just, I believe so much in this. I'm so excited to share it with you. I'm going around doing this this with all the life groups. If I haven't gotten to yours yet, I'll be there. Uh, If your group leader doesn't have me scheduled, have them contact the office and I'll be there. Um, Also in October on the 10th and uh, the 13th, we are going to be having um, some all church or some meetings where everyone's invited. If you haven't heard this yet, or if you want to hear it for another time, Uh, We want to invite you to uh, put one of those on your calendar. So today, as we uh, wrap up the, our series um, called United, we're going to tell a story from the early church when two of the New Testament heroes had a dispute. And on the surface, it, it wasn't great. It wasn't great. In fact, there was some division as a result of this dispute. And honestly, we don't know exactly how it all ended. We're going to infer some things today. Um, but, but it shows us Uh, It shows us that God was at work in the early church, even when things weren't perfect. You know, sometimes when we look at the early church, we kind of um, over-romanticize it. We look at it as like this kind of like perfect, flawless time. The fact is, the early church had people, like our church has people. And if you have people, you have problems. If your pastor is a person, you have a problem, right? Because we have problems as well. So, So this is not a new thing. Um, But let's look at kind of one of their conflicts they had today. It's found uh, between a guy named Paul, who you're probably familiar with. He was one of the greatest evangelists of the early of early Christian church. Uh, Paul wrote 25% of the words in the New Testament, a very impactful man. And another man uh, named Barnabas. Uh, Barnabas was one of the early leaders in the church. Uh, Barnabas, in fact, was, was a Christian before Paul was a Christian. Uh, so these are, are two people who were very, very influential in the early church. Acts chapter 15, after some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark, but Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, and as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. Then he traveled throughout Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. Okay, so there's a big division here, and kind of give you a little bit of of backstory here. Um, First, Barnabas' introduction comes back in Acts chapter 4, where it says this, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, who the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. That's one heck of an intro, right? Like, we haven't even said what he's doing. We're just telling you who he is. Well, he sold a field he owned and and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Okay, so Joseph is a guy. We know he's a Jewish guy. Um, He's, in fact, a a Levite, which was the the priestly tribe. He doesn't live in Israel. He lives in Cyprus. 
and he has a great reputation. He is such an encourager that they literally name him Son of Encouragement. And most people's names, by the way, meant Son of something then, okay? So this is basically saying this guy is, he's an encourager. Let's just call him that. He's like the best encourager out there. We're going to just give him that name, in fact. And he also was generous. He saw a need, and so he sold some property that he had, and he brought, and he donated that money uh, to be able to help meet the need. So, I mean, you can't help but like Barnabas. He's a kind, generous, good guy. In fact, we get another glimpse of his character when, when Saul comes on to the scene. Remember, Saul was his original name, uh, named after, of course, the great king Saul from the Old Testament, right? Uh, so Saul um, was a very high-ranking Jewish leader, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he says. And Saul was on a mission to defeat what he saw as a heresy, this, this Christian heresy. He saw this as, as being in conflict with God's word from the Old Testament. He, he didn't understand it yet. And so Saul was on a mission so strongly he was going around persecuting the church, uh, even having Christians killed for their faith. So, so then Saul is on a trip where he's going to Damascus for this exact purpose, and Jesus decides to meet him. The risen Christ decides to meet him. He appears to him in, in, in power, and it knocks him off his horse, right? It blinds him. Uh, Jesus confronts him for, for persecuting, not just the church, but persecuting Jesus. And so, so Saul has been confronted. He's left blind, and his life has just been upended. And who does God bring into the scene? A guy named Barnabas. Barnabas was one of the guys who would vouch for Saul, saying that this guy, has, God has called him. God has changed his life. If it were not for Barnabas, some scholars say that we wouldn't even have Paul as a central leader in the church. Because after all, would you let somebody be in the church who was just trying to kill the church? That seems, to, I don't think he really passed the background check, you know? It, it, it was a big, big risk on the church's part here. And Barnabas was one of the people who had, who had spoken for Paul, who had affirmed Paul, okay? So, so, he, so Paul and Barnabas go way back. They took a mission trip, a trip where they went all over the known world at the time, doing exactly what Jesus said to do, to go into all the world to preach the good news. So Paul and Barnabas, they've gone, they've served together, they, they've, they've witnessed for Jesus together, they've seen lives change, they've planted churches together. These guys go way back. They're tight. They're ministry partners. So after this first journey, it's been a little bit, Paul says, you know what, we should, we should go back. We should go back and we should check out these churches. But the thing was, there was another deal, if you remember, from the first trip. They had taken this guy whose name was John. Sometimes he's called Mark. We often refer to him as John Mark. John Mark was a young man that they had taken along with him. He wasn't just any young man, though. He was actually Barnabas's cousin. So, so Barnabas's cousin had gone along on the trip. He had been with them, but it said there uh, back in verse 38, he had not continued with them in their work. At some point, he deserts them. They're on this big mission trip, and John Mark, at some point, we don't know why, but he had had enough. I don't know if he just missed mom's cooking. I don't know if he was just tired of it all. I don't know if he was tired of it. I don't know why. For some reason that Scripture doesn't tell us, he decides to head out. And Paul takes it personally. Paul is upset by this. This bothers him significantly. You see, Paul is, is a driven ministry leader. Like Paul, has, he's on a mission. He's working hard. He's committed. I mean, this guy gets shipwrecked. He gets beaten. He gets jailed. None of this even slows him down. They let him out. He's just at it again, right? He cannot be stopped from sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. So you imagine if you're that guy and then you're on a mission trip and, and one of the people on the mission trip is like, nah, I think I'm going to go home. I'm good. That doesn't sit well. That doesn't sit well at all. You are ultra committed to this faith and this mission and, and John Mark deserts him. John Mark steps away. And so this was, this was difficult. This was very difficult for Paul. Um, verse 13, from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed from Perga to Pamphylia, where John left them for Jerusalem. That's it. That's all we know. We don't know why. I wish we knew why. It's one of those times I'm like, hey, could we tell us more of the story? And the Bible's like, no, we're going to keep on rolling here. 
I don't know why we don't get more of the story, but this leads, leaves a bad taste in Paul's mouth. So when they're going to go on the trip again, when they're going to go on this next mission trip, it's suggested that maybe John Mark should go along with them. But Paul, you know, Barnabas wanted to do this because Barnabas wants to give him another chance. Remember Barnabas, son of encouragement, right? It's like, you know, John Mark, he kind of, I, I know it wasn't great the first time, but, you know, let's give the guy another chance, right? He, he's a good guy. I'm sure he'll do better this time. Let, let's give him another chance. He, need, he needs some encouragement. We can help him out. And Paul's more like, nope, we're not having that. We're, we're on a mission. We're focused. I can't deal with his drama. I can't deal with him leaving us. Like, no, we're, we're not taking John Mark once again. Paul doesn't trust him. He doesn't trust him. And so they divide. Here you have two of the biggest church leaders of the early church, and they're having a disagreement about one guy and whether he should go on a trip, right? I mean, this is not like, this is not a central theological dis disagreement. This is a, a pragmatic disagreement of whether or not this guy would be, would be effective. And unless you think this is a small thing, it says in our translation they had a sharp disagreement. In the original language, that word sharp implies a deeply felt irritation or anger, okay? Their, their feelings are strong about this. This isn't a minor disagreement. It's a sharp disagreement. And they divide. They each go on their own mission trip. So what do we do with this? What do we learn from this? Because the, the Bible doesn't, it, it will we'll infer some things later on, but the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how it all ended up. But I think there is three things that we can, we can take, or, or a few things we can take from this. But one of the first things is, is that to recognize that even in the best of situations, Christians disagree sometimes. Christians have disagreements, and sometimes we don't get them all sorted out quite right. There is no perfect church. The early church, not a perfect church, right? And, and uh, Billy Graham famously said, if you find the perfect church, don't join it, you'd spoil it. <laughs> True. Or for me, don't lead it. You'd absolutely spoil it, right? We're, we're all humans. We all mess up sometimes. Sometimes we're, we're, sometimes we're wrong, or sometimes our ideas aren't the best. Like, that, that happens, right? And, and so, so, you know, it, it always um, intrigues me sometimes, you know, when, when um, like, you have a membership class, and, like, you know, everybody, there's people who change churches from time to time. That's normal and okay. But every now and then, you have folks that change, like, every three weeks or something, right? And they'll be like, this is the best church I've ever seen, right? Anderson Hills, it's awesome. And in the back of my mind, like, I'm thinking, I hope that's true, but I think in three weeks, we're going to be the one that is next on your list, right? Because you'll find out that we aren't perfect either, we're people as well. And sometimes we mess things up. Sometimes I mess things up. We love Jesus. We want to do this the best we can, but we are imperfect. But beyond that, what, what do we learn from this? Uh, you know, like I said, we don't know a lot about it, but we do know that things must have worked out in time because the, the mission trips went off. Um, they, they seem to be successful, as best we can tell. Um, Paul speaks in his later letters, he speaks highly of John Mark in 2 Timothy, written much after this. So clearly, it's not that he wrote off John Mark forever, and it implies that things must have gone well with him and, and, Paul, and Barnabas, because he regards John Mark as a colleague of great value in ministry. Um, Paul also speaks highly of Barnabas in other letters as well. So again, he's not angry with them forever. This isn't some like whatever, and the, and the church didn't divide over it. There was no church of Paul and church of Barnabas. This, this wasn't a thing. They, they went their own ways on this trip, but it didn't divide the church. So I think there's three things that we can learn from this. First of all, how you disagree with other Christians matters. How you disagree, how you disagree with other Christians matters. There are many times where there are issues that are not like biblical black and white issues, okay? There's times where there's those kinds of issues um, that, that we're going to disagree. Now, sure, there are other times where they are biblical issues. You know, for example, if you get one person wants to lie, cheat, steal, whatever, or to justify that, whatever it is, we say, no, that's, that's clearly wrong. 
read the Bible, read the Ten Commandments. Read, it's, it's very clear this isn't okay. So it doesn't mean that we always agree on everything. And, there's, and the Bible, God's Word, is always, is always the rock that we're standing on there. It's, it's not personal opinion. It's, it's the Word of God. I'm not here to be an editor of the Word of God. I'm here to share God's Word with you. Because God's Word changes lives. It's powerful. It's powerful. And so, but when there are times that, that we're talking about something that is not a matter, matter of clear biblical direction, that there's going to be times where we have some disagreements. I mean, look at this one. You think, you know, again, with, with Barnabas says, we should give him another chance. We should extend grace. Paul's like, no, we shouldn't take the risk of messing things up. Who was right? I don't know. I'm not sure. The Bible never settles that. In fact, here, we'll settle it today. Why don't we vote here, okay? So how many of you would say that, that you believe that Paul is right, we, we, we need to be mission-focused, we shouldn't take the risk, John Mark's liability, leave him home? How many of you would say that? You can raise your hands. A couple. I thought we'd have more. I mean, you know, you're voting against Paul. Hello. <laughs> All right. How many of you are like, no, give the guy some grace. He deserved another chance. You're Barnabas in, right? Okay. Yep. So we're, we're strongly in the Barnabas camp, it seems. All right. Um, some of you didn't vote, and I know what you're saying. You're like, I'm voting for Jesus. Well, guess what? <laughs> he wasn't on the ballot in this one, so you lost your chance to vote. Bad choice on your part. I'm sorry. Paul needed some more votes. You weren't there for him. Seriously. We, it's, it's a matter of personal opinion, right? It's not a matter of moral right or wrong. Probably that's why the Bible doesn't try to solve this one for us. It just tells us what it was. Maybe, maybe Paul's being too business focused. Maybe Barnabas is uh, having some nepotism for his cousin here. I, I'm not sure. We just don't know. But we know by the fruit of what happened that God actually worked through this and how they handled the situation. We, we, and I'm not saying that that means their disagreement was God's will. The Bible's not really clear that it was. But we know that God absolutely worked through this. They both held their convictions strongly, but they didn't lose sight of the mission. Neither one of them said, you know what? I'm so sick of this. I'm not even going on a trip. I'm just going to stay home. No. They both knew what God had called them to do. That's, they, they couldn't compromise that. They knew they were called to go and to spread the gospel. They knew they were called to take this trip, so they chose to take two trips instead of one. This is, this is what they chose to do. How you disagree matters. How you disagree matters. They didn't burn it down. They didn't, they didn't cause a big division in the early church. They didn't ask him to vote like I just asked you to vote, right? They, they didn't do that. They just simply... They went their own ways in this situation. How you disagree matters. And God turned their division into multiplication. Because God took those two trips and used them in even greater ways than what would have likely come with them together. It doesn't mean that God caused their division, but God worked through it. God works through human frailty all the time. That's how the kingdom of God grows. It's not, it doesn't grow because of our perfection the Bible says we hold this treasure in, in earthen vessels or jars of clay. That's us, right? We're, we have this treasure from God, and the fact that God works through us shows that the power is God's, not ours. That it's God's power at work. But how you disagree matters. The way that you end things. If you look at the way that you end things in life, do you do so by the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Or would people look at the way you end things and not even know that you're a Christian? Think about the last job that you left. Would they know that you're a Christian by the way that you exited? Think about um, the way maybe you had to end a business agreement. Would people know that you're a follower of Jesus by the way that you handled that disagreement? Or maybe you had to, you moved out from some roommates. Would people know that you're a follower of Jesus? Do you show that in the way that you did that? What about if you ended a dating relationship? Would the other person say, you know, I disagree with them. There's some hurt, but, but I appreciate the way they walked that out. The way that you end things matters. It absolutely does. I, I say to church staff routinely that, that, the way that the way that a person leaves their role on staff shows more about their character than the way that they lived out it when they were doing the job. 
The way that you leave when there's nothing else, there's no more authority, there's no more responsibility. The way that you leave, that is who you are. That is who you are. That's your character. How you disagree with other Christians matters. I, I, one of the things I love about Anderson Hills is that we have such great examples of this, like how people, um, looking at staff, how people have departed well, and not in, um, not in conflict. Like I'm thinking of my predecessor, Pastor Mark Rowland. Like, he didn't leave in conflict. He, he retired. Praise the Lord. That's a good thing to be able to do. Uh, but Mark set the bar so high of what it means to transition leadership. Mark set us up so well. I, when I was coming here, I had friends, pastor friends, who were like, wait, you're going there, and, and the, the pastor of like 18 years is still sticking around the church? That's a bad idea. Like, no, it's a great idea because I know him. I know his character. I know who he is, and I know his love for the Lord and his love for this church. So I came here 0% worried about that because, because I, know, I know who Mark is. And you see, how you leave, whether it's in disagreement or whether it's in just a healthy thing like that, how you leave matters. Second, keep your eyes on the mission. Keep your eyes on the mission. They did not let this dispute stop them from pursuing what God told them to do. Too often, we let a fallout with another Christian interfere with our ability to serve. And, and look, your, your beef is with another person, not with the Lord. Okay? If you have a fallout with another Christian, it's not that God is angry with you or after you. It's that you have a problem with another human. That happens. That's part of of the human experience. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll hear people say like, well, I don't, I don't go to church anymore because somebody, somebody was mean or because there's hypocrites or, or whatnot, right? And the fact is, yes, there are hypocrites at Anderson Hills. All of us. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. We, we don't make it a desire to be that way. Don't get me wrong. It's not a goal. We're not happy when we mess up. In fact, we confess our sins because he's faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we're not perfect humans. So sometimes there will be fallout. Keep your eye on the mission. Or somebody says, you know, I'm not going to serve in that ministry anymore. I just, I just can't get over how that person acted. Okay, well, there is time to move on. Paul and Barnabas, they show that. The thing I'd always ask, though, is does this person's attitude, what does that have to do with God's call in your life? Are you still called to this? If God hasn't released you from this call, then sometimes we just kind of deal with people we disagree with. It's part of life. Sometimes there's going to be people in, in, in the world that we disagree with, and, and, and we do that. Other times there's these Paul and Barnabas moments where we need to kindly and graciously step into something new. But what they don't do is take their eyes off the mission. Sometimes we find ways to do the mission a little differently, that's godly. But we don't take our eyes off the mission. We don't just sit out. Paul and Barnabas, they didn't just take their toys and go home. No, they both went out on mission. They each selected the mission partner they felt led to go with. Paul with Silas, Barnabas with John Mark, and they went out and God used them in big ways. See, Satan loves to use human conflict to drive a wedge between us and the Lord or us and one another as a church. It doesn't need to happen. Paul and Barnabas, they, they went their separate ways, but neither of them left the ministry. Neither of them left their calling. They kept on doing what God, what God had called them to do. They were following something bigger than themselves. So we keep our eye on the mission. Third and finally, Christian unity is not the same as uniformity. Okay? Christian unity is not the same as uniformity, meaning that we have different ideas about how to go about certain things. Now, again, there, we, we have the Word of God, which is our central guide. We, we don't deviate from that. That's not an option because it's God's Word. It is our guide. He's given this to us as the Word of the Lord. It has always been powerful. It always will be powerful. It's changing lives today, just like it always has. But we will have di different ideas about how to go about different things that aren't of biblical uh, where the Bible's not ultra clear on or ultra prescriptive. There'll be times where we have different opinions or insights, and, and, and that's certainly going to happen. Uh, and I love the fact that at Anderson Hills, we have people who think differently on a whole wide range of things. 
I, I love getting to talk with you all because, because I hear different ideas about this, that, and the other thing. We're going around doing these Rise Up meetings now, and I hear so much great input and feedback. And, and as a whole, there's a whole lot of unity. There really is. But every now and then, there's things where people disagree a little bit. And it's funny because they'll give me feedback as to what we should do. And it's like exactly the opposite of what somebody else said like two hours earlier in that meeting, you know. And I love that. I want that. I don't want us to be a church that everybody thinks the same all the time. That's, that, that's not like, I mean, God created a very beautifully diverse world. And I love the fact that we have a diversity of opinions and ideas here. That's really important because Christian unity does not mean that we always agree on everything. It doesn't mean that. This is, but if we can love each other, if we can care for each other, if we can be kind and, and live out the fruits of the Spirit when we disagree, this is going to look very differently than the way that the world tends to operate today. The current climate that we're in is a climate of win at all costs, all or nothing. So if you don't agree with me on absolutely everything, then you must be the enemy and you're out. It's like nuance is dead. We've, we've lost somehow the, the value of like thinking deeply about these things and wrestling with things that are really difficult problems and being able to respect the fact that sometimes we're going to come out on different ideas of what the solution should be and we can still love and care for one another. It's been said that for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. <laughs> I like that. There's a reason these are complicated problems. And oftentimes we hear, I'll just pick on our politicians, we hear politicians, it's, it's so simple, it's that I'm all right about everything and the other person is clearly the devil, right? And that's it, you know? And like, that's, it's not that simple. These are oftentimes complex problems. And when we as Christians fall into that kind of thinking, that all or nothing kind of thinking, we can often be people who lack love and grace or, or even nuance in our ability to, to disagree with one another. You, you, you may have heard, you may have heard that there's an election coming up. Uh, if so, I just want to let you know, in November, it's happening. And if you haven't registered to vote, go do it. I don't think it's too late. You should do this. This is important stuff. I've, I've, heard, I've heard people and even pastors say that you can't be a Christian and vote for so-and-so. And I've heard it for both candidates, by the way, right? You can't be a Christian and vote for so-and-so. And guess what? The Bible doesn't say that. It just, it doesn't. It doesn't. That's not what the Bible says. If, if you believe that the Bible fully affirms your chosen candidate, then either you don't know the Bible or you don't know your candidate very well. Because neither Trump nor Harris are the kingdom of God come down to earth. They're not. And if we're like a normal group of people... Probably the majority of you have already figured out who you're voting for. You're already very strong on this. That's, you, that, that, that's fine, right? And the question is, do, are you able to interact with others who disagree with you and do so in love and respect? And are you able to see the way that the Word of God challenges your chosen candidate? If not, you need to look more closely at the Word of God to understand, because I think you'll hold things with more humility and more love if, if you do that. Uh, worldly politics are saturated with corruption, pride, and sin. That's true today. It's always been true. It always will be. It's not that it, we need elections. We need, don't get me wrong. I'm very thankful to live in America where we elect our leaders. It's a wonderful thing. It's an amazing blessing. We should never take it for granted. But it doesn't mean that it's perfect or, or easy. How you love people from a different political view than yours may be more revealing of your Christian character than how you vote. And don't get me wrong, how you vote, I, I think they're important things. But how you love people who disagree with you will show more about your Christian character than anything else in this election season. A pastor friend of mine from another church told a story of two church members of his that he loves. He's not Anderson Hills people. Um, and one of them posted on Facebook about where you could go to pick up Democrat Party signs and encourage everybody to do that. 
Another person in the congregation, a very strong Republican, saw this post, and, and he responds and says, say it ain't so. And the pastor's heart had been, he begins to sink, thinking, oh boy, here we go again, right? Then he posts another post, and he says this, you know I love you. I'm so glad we can be on different sides and still enjoy, I'm so glad I can be on a different side and still enjoy who you are. I would do anything for you. You're the best. She responded, I love you too. Now, obviously these people are friends, right? That's not exactly how you talk just a random stranger, but my pastor friend said that he almost teared up because these two church members said more about Christ in that short post than 99% of the dialogue we see online. They don't agree. They're going to vote differently, 100% sure of that. But they, they, they were loving and kind and caring to one another. Neither surrendered their convictions. But at the end of the day, I think they pointed people to Christ. I think they pointed people to Christ. They demonstrate, demonstrated a love that transcends dispute. Why is this important? Because when they asked Jesus, What's the most important law? What do you say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, your st- and strength. And second, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus simplifies it for us. That this is who we are called to be. That doesn't mean we won't disagree. Paul and Barnabas disagree. Disagrees that they, they were not able to work that out. They went their separate ways on this trip. But we see through their interact. We see through Paul's writings. We see that he loved them. We see that God used this. That even though they couldn't come to terms on this, even in their flesh they couldn't do this. The way they handled this allowed this to be possible. How do we do it? Colossians gives us a, a clue. Colossians one verse seventeen. Jesus existed before anything else. He holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, okay? So this is the key. The the church is described in the Bible as the body of Christ, and Christ is the head. And 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 you you can't have more than you know, you can't have more than one head. You gotta have a functional head, right? For for this to work out, you know, for the body to be functional. We must stay connected and be driven by the head. And Jesus is what's driving all of us. Jesus, our love for him, following him, this is what is central to all of us. And if we let anything else be our central driver, if you let your favorite politician or party be your central driver, you're getting it wrong. You're getting it wrong, friend. Jesus is the one. Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is our leader. Jesus is the one we follow. Jesus is the one who unites us. Jesus is the one who calls us. Jesus is the one who we serve. His love is greater than all of our division. We're not going to see eye to eye on everything in this world, but we're going to be united in our love for him. A.W. Tozer said it beautifully. He said, Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to a standard by which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers meeting together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. I love that. He basically says, do you want to be united with the others? Turn your eyes on Jesus. Walk in the fruits of the Spirit. Treat others. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Let this be the way that we operate. Let this be the way that we are known. And when we disagree, we're going to show those fruits of the Spirit in the way that we disagree. And sometimes we may change our opinions and be united in thought. Other times we may have some Paul Barnabas moments where we say, you know, I just don't see it that way, but, but I bless you and you serve the Lord in this way. I'm going to serve the Lord in this way. And we're going to trust him to, to work out the details. Real unity comes when we take our eyes off each other and put our eyes on Jesus. Paul and Barnabas, they had a sharp disagreement, all right, but they didn't abandon the Lord. They didn't abandon their mission. And in fact, I think that God uses them in this as a great example for us. I'm wondering today, 
I'm wondering today if you would examine your own heart. Think about the people that you disagree with. It could be politics or it could be something totally different. I just use that as an example. Think about the people that you disagree with. Maybe, maybe the Lord wants to show you some things in this moment. In fact, I just want to pray and just ask the Lord to do that. So come, Holy Spirit. You've spoken to us through your word. Would you speak to us directly about our own lives? Are there areas, God, where I am harboring bitterness, anger that's not healthy, resentment? Forgive me, God. Would you soften that, that heart that can be like a heart of stone? Would you take it away and replace it with a heart of flesh that is tuned to you, God? God, are there things that I have said or done in disagreement that simply don't reflect your call in my life? Are there comments that I've made in person or online? Is there gossip that I have initiated or spread? Are there ways that I have spoken about or to others that just didn't honor you? Forgive me, Lord. Help everything I say and do to reflect your power, your presence in my life, Holy Spirit. God, I sense that for some, there may be some hardness in heart because we experienced it growing up. We experienced, whether it be meanness, abuse, divisiveness. Somehow we, somehow we determined that this world is only able to be navigated if we are really tough, hard-hearted to others. Maybe we did that out of protection for ourselves. God, I pray that you would soften our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would bring healing to those dark places. Maybe we've been clutching onto them for a long time. Jesus, great physician, would you touch us and heal us? God, I pray that you would, you would replace these hearts of stone with hearts of flesh, flesh that is connected to you as our head, our leader, our Lord. I pray that you would help us to follow you in everything that we do, God, that you would help us to honor you in the way that we agree and disagree with others, God. I pray that we as a church would be one as Jesus, you and the Father are one. That is such a ridiculously high standard. We will only live it out by the power of your Holy Spirit. So, God, I pray that you would help us to do that. Come, Holy Spirit. Make us one in you. We love you, God, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together. If, if you would like to continue in prayer, you're welcome to come forward to this altar. It's a place of, of healing, of transformation. We would, uh, we would love for you to come and seek the Lord here. We'd love to pray over you if the Lord leads you. So won't you stand and come and sing?